Goeiedag. Uh, hartelijk welkom. Ik hoop dat het goed verstaanbaar is op deze manier. Um, mijn naam is Jan Overwijk. Hartelijk welkom. Uh, ik sta hier namens uh, de nieuwe universiteit. Overigens gaan we het in het Engels doen, dus. Uh, welkom. <laughs> uh, Jan Overwijk uh, from the new university Utrecht, but also a Rethink Utrecht uh, University. Um, we are here organizing a lunchbox lecture every day in the Eighth Kamer. Uh, we are organizing one of them. Yesterday we had uh, Trudy de Hu. Today we have uh, Willem Schinkel. I will introduce him in a second. But firstly, uh, let me remind you what the university, the new university, does. Um, we are here really to open the conversation um, on the topic of the university as an organization. So, for example, you may have heard um, the conversation that was sort of um, ignited with the Bungehuis occupation and the Maagdehuis occupation in Amsterdam, uh, where, we, where they questioned, uh, for example, the rendementsdenken. So uh, thinking uh, of students and of the university all in terms of, of money and return on investment. Um, now we are here to question that kind of logic and uh, today uh, Willem Schinkel will uh, do his, uh, his part, his duit in het zakje. But also he's very critical of this, uh, of some, uh, some aspects of this movement, which is a very nice um, critical voice inside this conversation. Uh, he is a professor in sociology at the Erasmus Universiteit in Rotterdam. Um, sociology, but he's also sort of a philosopher, so he's really on the critical edge of, of sociology. I think we can uh, expect a very interesting talk from him today. I would like to welcome him here with an applause. Willem Schinkel. Uh, thank you. Um, some time ago, some weeks ago, I was in a debate in Amsterdam with the uh, board of administrators there, and the rector of the university started saying, she sat next to me, she started saying, well, the type of company that a university is, and then she thought, oh God, <laughs> and uh, everybody said, well, that's precisely the problem, the university is not a company. Yesterday, I was talking to an administrator at my own university, uh, about what's going on in the Maarten House and elsewhere in the, in the Netherlands, and also at the LSE, by the way. Um, and uh, he said, uh, well, the university is the type of company that, and I said, wait, well, is that, isn't that a problem? Uh, so there is a clear sense of a problem, and it's very good that it's there. I think that even, you could even say that what happened in Amsterdam and what's now sort of following in its trail, has actually, actually constitutes a kind of political event in that th things that were taken for granted, that were commonsensical, have now become up for debate. Uh, and I think that's very good. But I think that um, that's also where it seems to end at the moment. Uh, I think, and that's basically going to be my point today, that nobody has a real idea of what a university is for, of why universities should be publicly funded. And I think that that goes for students, for staff, and for administrators. So it's way too easy to point at administrators and say that they're screwing us all, uh, as is, uh, happens very often now. It's also way too easy uh, to say, well, we should have a discussion within the university itself only. I think we should uh, have come to a much broader conception of the public tasks of the university. I think at the moment, nobody really has that. Me neither, but I will uh, try to give some thoughts as to uh, the direction in which we might think. Now, the first question is, of course, what is a university? Do we really know what a university is anymore? Uh, uh, the uh, president of the uh, a University of California system in the 1960s, Clark Kerr once said that a university is a bunch of individual faculty entrepreneurs held together by a common grievance over parking. <laughs> he also said that a, a university is there to provide sex for the students, a parking for the faculty, and sports for the alumni. Um, now, 
The third thing he said, and that's the most interesting thing, I think, is that a university is really a multiversity. It's not a university, it's a multiversity. It does many things, and that gives us a somewhat confusing take on the university because there are different interests within the university, and it's very difficult to say what the university is for. That goes for today as well. We do, since the 19th century, we combine teaching and research, but universities are much more. In a certain sense, yes, universities are also companies. They have university colleges, they have housing, they have companies, they have patenting uh, going on. So all these things, are, these things are going on at the same time. Um, at the same time, we seem to have lost what Cardinal Newman once called the idea of the university. There have been several ideas of the university, that is to say, legitimations of what a university is for. Most famously is the Kantian University of Reason. Um, another one is the Humboldtian University of the National Culture, uh, which uh, uh, posed Bildung as the ideal and uh, was a way to educate uh, an elite of uh, national administrators. Um, there was Cardinal Newman's idea of the university as a crucial site of uh, the birth of civilization. Um, we have lost all those ideas. Uh, recently, I was in a discussion with some people in Amsterdam, which is where much of this discussion seems to be going on, and uh, someone said, what do you mean we don't have an idea of the university? It's Bildung. Uh, and uh, this was apparently an anthropologist who failed to look beyond the fact that Bildung is a very elitist white ideal that has to do with educating an elite of administrators so as to guarantee and some idea of a national culture. If you look around uh, uh, in our universities today, the very idea of Bildung is bullshit. Nobody is interested in that. It's not a way to legitimate what we do. We might want more aspects of building back, but certainly today it is a moot concept. And nobody seems to really believe that they're in the business of building. Um, so uh, we don't have those stories. That should be the beginning. We have a story about excellence. So excellence is basically what came on the scene uh, in, in our universities. Once all those transcendental legitimations of what we have a university for, reason, national culture, civilization, once those ideals became incredible, so in incredible, I mean. Um, so we have excellence, and that's fine because it means exactly nothing. <coughs> excellence is a tautology because it's the answer to what is good research or teaching. Well, good research or good teaching is excellent teaching. It's a bullshit concept, and that's why it works. The cafeteria can be excellent. The parking department of the university can be excellent. The ICT company, uh, 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 the, uh, the ICT uh, department can be excellent. Everybody can be excellent, because excellence means nothing. So it's a kind of cloak. It's a kind of cloak that hides that we really do not know so very well what the university is for and why it is publicly funded. Um, still, it's way too easy to say, well, the administrators gave us this idea of excellence and uh, they leave us with no real legitimation. I think we all did that. Now, what happened in Amsterdam is partly a response to, I think, to this situation. First of all, it was a unique combination of events going on in Amsterdam, at the University of Amsterdam, that made this possible. There were budget cuts in the humanities, and there was a plan in the uh, physical sciences to merge with another university also in Amsterdam. And that gave a, a kind of university-wide solidarity, uh, and that made this possible. Uh, and it's really a political event to appropriate space. But the question is then, as is always the question the day after the revolution, what, do, what to do? Uh, so for what? 
were they or are we approach, appropriating space? And um, on behalf of whom do we speak? It's not the entire university that's there. It's a small minority, I think. So one of the things that is most striking in what happens now is that we have the affirmation of ideals of autonomy. Autonomy is basically the, uh, the main way in which the new university and Rethink UVA and Rethink Erasmus and all these other Rethinks uh, um, try to legitimate what they're doing. But autonomy is just as much a cloak as excellence, I would say. Um, what happens if you look at what at the university from, from a bit of an outsider's perspective, is that if that's possible, is basically that certain privileges are at stake. When the uh, protests arrived in Amsterdam, when privileges were at stake, when positions, faculty positions were at stake, in the humanities, for instance, when people had to merge with another university. So when positions are threatened, people mobilize, and this is really an aspect of universities. Universities are among the most conservative institutions ever, I would say. Um, since the early 16th century, there have been about 80 institutions that uh, have been alive all this time, and that still exist, under the same name, and sometimes in the same buildings, about 70 of these are universities. So universities are inherently very, very conservative, and I think that what we see now is partly uh, a disconservatism, because the affirmation of autonomy is too little. We have to come to a more, a broader understanding of what the university is for if this movement is to really mean something. Now, what happens in uh, all Dutch universities now where these protests uh, occur is that democracy is put forward as a solution. Personally, I was very very excited when the Magnehuis uh, occupation or reappropriation took place. Partly because it occurred on the basis of a model of democracy that operates not on the basis of consensus, but on the basis of contestation. I think that's a much more interesting model for democracy, to, is to contest power and not to become part of the power not to become part of those who take the decisions. Yet everywhere I talk to people dissatisfied with what, ha what happens at the university is that democracy is watered down to some desistive version, you know what that means, of what democracy means. Oh, they're so very radical in the Magda House. But what they basically mean is they want participation. They want referenda. They want to vote. What kind of concept of democracy is that? That's precisely the type of democracy that we know has all the problems it has on a national scale. That's also precisely the type of democracy that really in the end will only articulate the interests that are already the greatest and they will likely not be the interests of the humanities in the case of Amsterdam. So this type of um, democracy, calls for democracy, I find them unconvincing. The same goes for the sort of neologism, uh, rendementsdenken. I really don't know how to translate that, if anybody has a, uh, a, a suggestion. It's, you know, are there any people not Dutch anyhow? <laughs> Why am I doing this in English? <laughs> it's being recorded for some stray stranger. Um, what is that about? We know that students on average spend 25 hours per week on their studies. So what's the problem? We know that students take more than uh, the three years for their bachelors. 
what exactly is the problem there? I think there are many problems. The first thing, thing should be to say, well, uh, if they spend only 25 uh, hours per week on their studies, we, the teachers, are doing something badly wrong because we fail to inspire them. And then the next step would be to say, why is this the case? Because the number of students has risen by 40%, but the number of uh, um, euros that we get for them has stayed the same. So immediately you need to shift the conversation to a much higher level and not simply say, well, there is this random denker, it's the administrators that do this, now if we install a democracy and we get to talk about what happens and we get to decide, all will be well. I'm afraid such is not the case. What we really need is a conception of democracy that is much broader and in which we have a view on the tasks of, a, of the university within democracy. So we need to shift the conversation also to outside the walls of the university. We are very good at talking to each other, but we are less good at talking to the world outside the university who is actually paying for what we do here. So nobody really is at fault for this. This is a development that's been going on for many years. Some aspects of it uh, are, for instance, the financialization of the university, about which Ewald Engle has uh, admirable things to say. But there are many other things going on, because many of the things we protest against uh, have been going on way before that financialization really took off, which is, according to Ewald, in 1995. So uh, we really have a lack of language to articulate what is not quantitatively expressible. We have a lack of language to articulate, for instance, value or quality. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that the solution is not simply to claim autonomy and to then say, we want democracy so we can decide and all will be well. Our problems, I'm afraid, are a bit bigger than that. Our problems begin with the fact that really we do not have a proper conception of what the public tasks of the university are. Why the university <coughs> is a public institution and what it contributes to democracy as a whole instead of saying we want democracy, which means we all get to talk along with power and decide what happens in the university. Contestation is what we need within the university. Let the administrators administer. It's what they're good at. If they come up with plans that suck, we contest them. For instance, by occupying a space or reappropriating a space that's very, very effective. What's not at all effective is to talk and to have debates and to participate. That's a way of watering down what you want, of losing why you are in this fight. So um, what we need then, secondly, is a conception of the public task of the university. And I will end with a uh, proposal of what those might be. The first public task of the university is simply accessible education. Many of the people involved in the protests now have a very conservative take on education because I often hear them say um, the university is a mass institution and it should be more exclusive. Too many people go to, to the university. Too many students. I think that's a reactionary point to make because it's basically saying we should be exclusive and in a labor market where you have to have a higher education degree to be at the checkout counter it's very, very irresponsible to say, we're going to be exclusive, we're going to refuse you, etc. So that's one consequence of taking accessible education seriously. Another is to not focus only, mainly, on extra funding for excellent students. That's the, the world topsy-turvy. The excellent students, so-called, are the students that don't need extra funding. If we need extra investments in students, then it's going to be for the students that are not considered excellent. A second public task of the university is free inquiry. 
our, gr our grant the autonomy argument there, which free inquiry means inquiry independent of state and market interests. It's very difficult to realize that, and um, I think a publicly funded university will always have the problem of how to remain independent from the state, because you're paid by the state, but still, it's a very strongly felt, and, and rightly so, uh, a public task of university. A third one is that a university is a, in a unique position to be, or to embody, a societal memory. Universities are knowledge archives. That means not only that they store knowledge, but they reuse knowledge and reconsider knowledge. And that means that this knowledge should be publicly available. So it means certain changes in the way we organize uh, our science. Uh, autonomy, I'll just put it to you, has given us, given us quantitative measurements of research, in research assessments, for instance. It's been autonomy that has led to the idea that you need to publish in American or British journals in order to be a good scientist. We have done that ourselves. No administrator has said, you must publish in these and these journals. It's been scientists themselves, and it's been possible on the basis of autonomy, which has made it possible for certain scientists to come up to positions of power and to dominate others. It's not the administrators, it's, it's us. And we've been able to do so on the basis of autonomy, which is therefore a problem. Um, final ta public task of the university, and I think the most important one perhaps in this discussion, is uh, the provision of public knowledge. That is knowledge that is publicly available, but it's not simply uh, a conception of university that produces knowledge and then communicates very well uh, and articulate to all kinds of audiences. Now, it's uh, experimenting with, with the production of knowledge in engaging with all kinds of publics. There is not the public out there. There are many publics, and we need to think much harder about it. Interestingly, uh, our current minister is experimenting with that in the National Science Agenda. Sadly, she's doing that by having a uh, by giving big business a very strong say in what science should be about, because they're at the table. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this movement is going on, and I see the same thing in Science in Transition, for instance, where this rigid idea of an autonomous university that does want to be publicly funded uh, is pitted against the public, and I think that's a very problematic conception. We really need to come to a conception of the public task of the university that means not only having an internal discussion and fencing us off against the outside by means of internal democracy and ideas of autonomy. We need to consider what a university, uh, what kind of public role a university has in democracy as a whole. And for that, I think, what happened in Amsterdam and what's happening in all these other Dutch cities is a very fruitful starting point. And it's really only a starting point. We are running the risk of having this momentum fade away because certain demands for internal democratization, basically a new governance model, uh, are going to be accepted and then we move on, which we did in the Netherlands when we had the, what's called the VIP, which happened in the United States uh, after uh, all kinds of failed democratization experiments. So the question is now, do we use this moment to draft the intricate details of a governance model that gives us a say in the decisions of the university with the effect that it mainly secures our own privileges? Or do we come up with a proper vision of what the public tasks of the university in a democracy are? Thank you.